Welcome back to This Week in Immigration. I'm Jordan LaPierre. On this week's program, a new effort to bar the Census Bureau from counting unauthorized immigrants. DHS takes the spotlight as it launches enforcement efforts in Portland. And we close the loop on the abandoned rule requiring in-person classes for foreign students. All that's just ahead. Stick around. And here with me today, as always, are Teresa Cardinal-Brown, Director of Immigration and Cross-Border Policy. She's on Twitter at BPC underscore T Brown. Hey, Teresa. Hi, Jordan. And Chris Ramon, Senior Immigration Policy Analyst on Twitter at C Ramon BPC. Hi, Chris. Hey, Jordan. All right. Thanks to you both for being here. So let's jump into it. Last week, President Trump signed a memo seeking to bar the Census Bureau from counting unauthorized immigrants in this year's census. Trump's prior effort to put a citizenship question on the census failed at the Supreme Court last year, and most thought the administration had set this issue aside. But in the wake of the court's recent decision on DACA, President Trump says he may issue executive orders or new legislation on merit-based immigration and a pathway to permanent status for DACA recipients. So, Chris, let's start here. What's the context for this new memo? So, basically, what we've seen is that Uh, President Trump and the White House have tried to sort of make immigration in the census a key issue that they focused on. Um, Obviously, the most obvious move is trying to count um, the the citizenship of individuals in the census, um, which eventually led to a 2019 Supreme Court ruling uh, that basically said that the president, at least the way they went about trying to get uh, immigrants counted in the census, um, didn't follow proper procedures. It didn't necessarily get into the legal questions necessarily around whether or not they could, but it was actually more of a, around a procedural uh, decision. And that actually was a pretty big one because, um, if I remember correctly, uh, John Roberts, Chief Justice, sided with the liberals on that decision. And it was kind of seen as a sort of rebu- repudiation of what the, the president wanted to do on this. Um, things have been sort of quiet since then. We, you know, there, there wasn't really that much noise around this, given the fact that the that the administration at least had this sort of partial loss on on trying to at least understand who the immigrants are in this country. Uh, but then, you know, they introduced uh, this new memo um, and kind of reignited the issue. And I think what's underneath all this is that there's at least been some suspicion that the administration doesn't want to have immigrants counted um, as a part of the census for um, either for, you know, for social services or tax benefits, or I think what this memo gets at a little bit more is actually around the issue of political representation um, in Congress uh, of these individuals. So it sort of is touched in, I think it, it touches on something they've been wanting to do. Um, and I think this memo, though, I think kind of articulates what they wanted to do from the beginning. Teresa, let's walk through exactly what the memo says. And I've seen many critics of the president suggest it's on shaky legal ground. What's your read on that as well? Well, I mean, there's a couple of things that stand out to it. First of all, it's not actually an executive order. It is a memorandum from the president to the Secretary of Commerce. And that's important to note up front because an executive order is binding on all the members of the executive branch until it is rescinded. So an executive order can last uh, past the president who issued it. We actually still have many executive orders that are still in play from past presidents. Um, So that's important to understand. It is not that. It is a memorandum directing the Secretary of Commerce when the Commerce Department prepares a memo for the president and the president then submits it to Congress saying what the results of the census are, he has asked the Secretary of Commerce to include in that memo an estimate that does not include undocumented immigrants in the count for apportionment. Apportionment is the constitutional requirement that congressional districts for House of Representatives members should represent to the extent possible a similar number of people. The argument that the administration is making is that under the census law that implements that constitutional requirement, the president has some discretion to determine who is considered a quote unquote inhabitant of the state 
and he is saying that it's the policy of his government that undocumented immigrants would not be counted among those numbers. The upshot of this is that if undocumented immigrants are not counted among the population in deciding the parameters of congressional districts, congressional districts that have a larger number of undocumented immigrants residing on them may lose representation. And states that have a larger number of undocumented immigrants may lose representatives in Congress. The memorandum actually, without naming California, talks about California as being one of those states, but other states could also lose out, such as Texas uh, or Florida or even Georgia that have had significant increases in the estimates of undocumented immigrants in those states. Um, now, there's a lot of language in here that says that the Secretary of Commerce should do this to the extent it is feasible and within the president's discretion. And I read that language to be a little bit of a hedging of the bets. Um, the feasibility of this is a very big question. We don't know how many undocumented immigrants are in the United States. We really don't. Everything that we have is an estimate. Now, we believe that these estimates are pretty close to accurate, but they're estimates. No one is out there actually counting people because they know their status. Um, these are all estimates that are drawn from census and from data we have about the number of legal immigrants and from estimates about deaths and people who've left and other things like that. So without having an accurate count of the number of undocumented, it is very likely that any estimate that's used for apportionment would be inaccurate as well. And I think that's one of the legal grounds that certainly people would challenge is the ability of the, of the Census Department and the Commerce Department to actually do this with any sort of integrity, especially because it would result, it could result in disenfranchisement of uh, US citizens if their congressional districts are redrawn in certain ways. Um, I think the broader question is, the Constitution mandates a count of all persons in the United States. And, and the, the courts have said over and over that all persons means everyone, regardless of their status. So this effort to try to draw a line around, if you will, those persons who are in an undocumented status for just this purpose uh, may or may not pass constitutional muster. And that's probably where you're going to see the inevitable lawsuits aimed at this. I stated in the intro that Trump has expressed an interest in pursuing more expansive reforms to immigration via executive actions. Teresa, what do those statements from the president reveal to you about the administration's potential immigration policy heading into the fall and the presidential campaign? Yeah, so it's interesting because when this uh, memorandum came out, it was in the middle of a week or so of speculation about an unknown executive order that the president uh, alluded to in the um, in in an interview with Telemundo, and then uh, restated in a press conference in the Rose Garden that he was going to sign some major executive order on immigration that would address DACA and creation of a merit-based immigration system. So we all thought that was going to be the next thing that we would see, and we haven't seen that yet. But there was a lot of confusion around that because he talked about signing a bill, and then he talked about signing an executive order. Most people believe that he can't fundamentally make major changes to our immigration system, such as creating a merit-based system, without legislation. So it's very uncertain how he can do it by executive order. And he, his, the lawsuit that went to the Supreme Court, in part, was based on his government's argument that the executive branch did not have authority to have DACA in place at all. So it's unclear how he would then argue that he could use an executive order to um, to implement any DACA changes. Yeah, and I think just the one thing to add on this point is, um, you know, this White House has various policy making streams. Sometimes it is directly from the White House and incorporating an agency like it's done with DHS and a lot of immigration issues. Sometimes, uh, you know, the president will say something and then they have to clean it up and try to implement it. Um, and so that's the key question is whether or not it's something like, you know, this, the second case of something that's being said. Uh, and basically now people have to sort of implement it. Um, so, you know, there's a, there's a lot of, the, 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 the bottom point is that there's a lot of speculation here um, as to what is being said. Um, 
you know, yeah, there, there may be a kernel of a nugget of an idea here, but um, it may be the case that's just simply President Trump heard something in the meeting and then said what he heard. And that's it. <laughs> nothing, nothing more to analyze that. But certainly I think, um, you know, pay attention and see what happens next is, is, is what always happens with immigration with this White House. Yeah, I, I would agree with Chris. There's a lot of people jumping to a lot of conclusions about what might happen and starting to worry about things. I, you know, I caution restraint until we see what happens, until we see what actually comes out. Uh, it's There's no way to really know what his thinking is or what all might be implicated or who might be um, affected by anything until we see what's going on. Okay, when we come back, unpacking the situation in Portland. In recent weeks, Portland, Oregon has returned to the spotlight as federal agents began taking enforcement actions against protesters near federal facilities in the city. Although these agents were not wearing any insignias to identify their affiliation, Customs and Border Protection eventually stated its agents were involved in the operations. I want to welcome in Dave LaPan, BPC's Vice President of Communications and a former DHS spokesperson to help break down how CBP can engage in these kinds of actions. Hi, Dave. Hi there, Jordan. So, Teresa, I'll start with you here. What are CBP and ICE's enforcement duties within the immigration and customs system? So it's important to understand that although most recently we think of Customs and Border Protection and Immigration and Customs Enforcement as primarily immigration agencies, they are also customs agencies. They both were formed from a merger of the former Immigration and Naturalization Service and pieces of the former U.S. Customs Service. So those agencies do bring together both immigration authorities under the Immigration and Nationality Act and customs authorities under the customs laws of the United States, which are fairly broad as well. In addition, as federal law enforcement officers who are sworn officers of the law, they do have the ability to conduct other law enforcement, um, uh, sorry, they do have the ability to conduct other law enforcement activities, particularly if there is crime committed in their presence. Um, so they have the ability, for example, to make arrests for other crimes that are committed within their, within their visibility. Um, that is that is the the natural uh, authorities they have under the statutes that created them, um, but they do have the ability to engage sometimes outside of those uh, authorities when they're working with other law enforcement agencies. Dave, how can CBP engage in law enforcement activity outside these border areas in cities like Portland? Well, again, as Teresa said, they have the authorities to do so. I think a couple of key points as as we're seeing uh, activities in Portland. One, it's highly unusual. So uh, even if uh, CBP and um, the part of DHS that is responsible for protecting federal property, federal buildings, the Federal Protective Service, FPS, um, they are normally not seen engaging these in these types of activities. Uh, obviously, FPS, again, with their mission to protect federal buildings, it's more likely that you will see them engage in those activities, but it is a bit unusual for people to see Customs and Border Protection acting in the way they have. Uh, and again, as Teresa said, they have those authorities. They are not ones that have been exercised much in the past, so it is unusual, uh, if not, uh, but not unprecedented. Um, the other thing that I would say about Portland is the. As you mentioned at the top, Jordan, the way that they're dressed, uh, insignias, names, things of that nature, especially because Customs and Border Protection has brought their BORTAC or their border, border tactical units into play into the city and they're dressed in camouflage and in military uh, looking equipment as well as uniforms. So I think that has been jarring for people to see as well. Um, it's important both in recognizing the authorities that uh, DHS, so all components of DHS that are law enforcement agencies, have um, in in situations like this, but also I don't think it's been clear enough in Portland to know where CBP and and Border Patrol and others who are operating where their jurisdictional boundaries are, uh, what specific authorities they're using for these things, 
it's been sort of opaque, which I think has also caused some of the concerns that have been raised about their activities in the city. Yeah, I would just add to that that when when CBP or ICE is working in conjunction with another law enforcement agency, oftentimes they are, if you will, deputized by that other law enforcement agency to exercise their authority. So they would borrow their authority from the other law enforcement agency, whether that's another part of DHS, like the Federal Protective Service, or sometimes if they're working alongside uh, Department of Justice law enforcement agencies, uh, such as may have been the case at Lafayette Park in Washington uh, when they were working with the U.S. Marshals Service. So um, that is not necessarily uncommon. It, it has happened a lot in recent years uh, in response, for example, to federal disasters uh, when there's a need for law enforcement to reduce looting after, after natural disasters. Um, but I haven't seen in my time, and, and Dave may probably the same, uh, when they have been put out, when they have been deployed this, in this means to uh, respond to protest actions, or in the case uh, of what's been said in Portland, uh, to protect federal facilities from protest actions. That's a new type of deployment that I have not previously seen. And another thing I'd add, you know, Teresa brings up a great point. Um, talks about the cooperation and coordination between the federal law enforcement agencies, in this case, you know, the elements of DHS and local authorities. What's highly unusual in the circumstances Portland is the lack of coordination or, again, as, as local law enforcement and officials said, they didn't ask for DHS to come in and help. In most of these cases, as Teresa said, in nat natural disasters or in other instances where they need help from federal authorities, usually the local officials will request that assistance and they will work cooperatively between federal, state, and local uh, on the issues that they face. So what's unusual here and maybe unprecedented is having DHS operating essentially on their own without the approval and cooperation of local officials and local law enforcement. And I think that's potentially dangerous because when you have, again, different authorities, different jurisdictions, crossovers, that's why uh, cooperation and coordination and deconfliction are so important. So each agency that's involved knows what the other's doing, what to expect, where their authorities are, where they're not, where jurisdictions begin and end. So when you lack that, that approval and that coordination, it sets up some potential for dangerous situations. Yeah, Dave, I want to pick up on that. You mentioned authorities and the working with local uh, agencies. Who has the authority to send these law enforcement agents into cities, and can local authorities ask them to leave? So there are a number of authorities that exist with the Secretary of Homeland Security. Uh, there are authorities for federal law enforcement that uh, exist within the Department of Justice and the Attorney General. Uh, and there are authorities that the President of the United States has. Uh, and with his executive order within the last week or so, he attempted to uh, delineate some of the authorities by which they were going to deploy these forces. So there are authorities that exist in these various agencies. Uh, how they are used is, again, unusual in this circumstance. Um, and while the local authorities certainly have the ability uh, and the right to ask um, federal authorities to leave, it's not clear that the, those federal authorities have to follow the dictates. Um, but that's, where, again, where it gets so dangerous if there's a disagreement about how uh, different law enforcement agencies should be acting in a particular place. You'd like to have that cooperation. So again, they have the authorities to do those types of things, but you want to have cooperation and coordination. Yeah, I, I, I analogize a little bit to the, the question about sanctuary cities and immigration law, right? Um, you know, local authorities can have their policies about to what extent the local authorities may want to engage or work with Immigration and Customs Enforcement, but they don't have the authority to tell Immigration and Customs Enforcement they can't operate and under their own authorities in their jurisdiction. And I think the same would apply in a case like Portland. If indeed the agencies are operating under federal authority within their jurisdiction uh, and within uh, property, 
you know, that is federally, that, that is federal property, um, then it may be that the local authorities do not have the ability to demand that they leave. Now, that, that leaves open the question, under what federal authorities are they acting? Have they exceeded the, those authorities in any way? Um, and I think that's where, that's where a lot of the, the, the legal questions uh, come about. But I, I, I definitely didn't want to go back to a point that, that Dave made, which is whether or not there is legal authority to do this, um, the use of DHS uh, officers and agents in these particular circumstances may or may not be the, may not be the right thing for the department to do uh, broadly. Um, it's inserting the department in uh, what had been, uh, you know, about uh, basically local police protests and um, and, uh, and and exercises of, of the First Amendment rights to the extent there's property damage or other threats that's something to be considered but the way they're engaging the the quote unquote show of force certainly the allegations of activities of uh, uh, of federal officials who are making arrests in unmarked vehicles without telling the people what they're being detained for um, or even what agency they represent um, those are those are significant concerns, and for a department like DHS, could undermine uh, whatever goodwill the public has for this federal agency in the conduct of its regular duties. Um, and I think that's something to think about. And last but not least, even if there is authority, and or CBP and ICE, who are regularly immigration enforcement agencies, are deputized to perform other types of enforcement actions, it doesn't mean they necessarily have the training or the understanding or ability to do that well or properly. And I think that's a that's also a concern. Jordan, I know you probably have other questions, but you know, as Teresa and I go, we, it brings up other topics. I'd like to add a couple points there. She's, Teresa's absolutely right. It's the perception uh, of DHS, the reputation. Uh, it's not unusual to think that people would question how uh, civil unrest in Portland is a threat to U.S. national security and why the Department of Homeland Security, again, the agency set up after 9-11 to deal with threats to the homeland, uh, would see it through that lens. The other thing that's disturbing is that the president himself has been very vocal and talked in very partisan political ways about deploying forces to cities, quote unquote, run by Democrats or run by the radical left. And so in that way, it pulls DHS into a very highly politicized environment. And that's harmful to the department as well. Dave, you mentioned earlier, and I want to kind of close here that some of these law enforcement agents are wearing military style uniforms, they're not wearing insignias. There's been a lot of conversation in recent weeks about the blurring of the lines between military and law enforcement. And I wonder how you see this incident playing into that broader conversation. Yeah, I think it's a real concern that, that there is a perception that this is a militarized response to civil unrest. Uh, we saw in Washington, D.C., in, in the wake of protests, a mixing of, of law enforcement agencies and National Guard troops wearing military uniforms. Uh, but when you have law enforcement agencies wearing camouflage uniforms, wearing helmets and body armor and carrying weapons that look like weapons of war, I mean, even for an experienced military person like myself and other veterans that I've spoken with, when we have to look very closely and very hard at photos and, and video to try to tell who these individuals are, you know, are they military? Are they not? Are they part of a militia? Are they law enforcement? Who are they? So when that level of confusion exists among people who know these things very well, you can imagine that your average citizen would have trouble discerning if this was a military response or a police law enforcement one. So I think the use of military style equipment and and uniforms um, certainly calls into question the perception that it that this is a militarized response so again in dc we had a mix of military and law enforcement in portland we don't have military we only have law enforcement but the appearance is that they are are military forces uh, and that's very dangerous to our country, 
uh, to the military and the Department of Defense, and I think to Homeland Security, is they are rightfully being questioned about why they have their law enforcement officers kitted up like they are soldiers in a combat zone. All right, Dave, I think that's a good place to leave this conversation. Thanks so much for joining us. Hey, thanks for having me as always. All right, after the break, the abandoned effort to require in-person classes for foreign students. Stick around. On our last episode, we discussed a proposed ICE rule that would have required international students to return to their home countries if their universities moved to all online instruction this fall. That rule would also have barred foreign students enrolled at universities with online-only classes from traveling to the United States. After public backlash and a series of lawsuits from colleges and universities, the administration announced on July 14th that it would abandon the effort in a rare retreat on immigration policy. Chris, Let's kind of bring things up to speed here. What happened after our last discussion on this proposal two weeks ago? So uh, basically the the cavalry arrived. Uh, <laughs> you know, it, it, it's it's impressive the amount of blowback that this policy has received um, in the leading up to its decision. Uh, basically what happened is that you saw sort of two patterns. One is just public pressure from universities um, different organizations representing um, universities, instructors, or uh, even just regular college students speaking up, speaking out against the policy and the potential impacts that would have on their institutions, on uh, the economies of their local communities, uh, and on students. But what you also saw, too, is a series of lawsuits that were filed against the proposed rule. The lead lawsuit was basically one from MIT and Harvard that had a lot of university and colleges um, sign on uh, as an amicus brief. Even my alma mater for undergrad, McAllister College, signed that. Um, And so you saw this huge push publicly against uh, this policy. And what happened is at least the for the initial hearing for the MIT Harvard lawsuit, the 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 administration just basically went in and said, we're rescinding it. And that was pretty shocking because, you know, frequently what we'll see with this administration is they're going to fight every immigration policy to the bitter end, even if it goes all the way to the Supreme Court. Uh, But that just didn't happen here. Um, And so for the time being, a lot of people have been pretty happy. who, you know, especially those obviously who oppose the policy with the outcomes that things, at least for the time being, it seems like um, this, you know, the administration standing down and there might be a possibility that students um, might be able to, you know, continue the studies in the United States. But I think there's a lot of questions of where the administration is going to go from here. Teresa, in the last episode, we discussed why this issue resonated so much with the public Chris seems to think that public pressure played a big role here. Do you agree that public pressure made the administration change course here? I think in part, yes. Um, You know, the, the, it, it, it started as a, what I would call below the radar uh, notification from the agency that runs the student and exchange visitor program, immigration customs enforcement uh, to Uh, by a press release and and basically to the schools and universities that host foreign students. That normally would not get national press attention, but the immediacy of the impact of that to those higher education institutions um, caused probably immediate panic um, because schools had already started deciding what their fall would look like. They already had students that were on campus or coming back to campus. The idea that they could turn on a dime on this, that there was no forewarning of this, uh, of this and that it would have significant logistical, financial, and humanitarian ramifications, I think generated that outcry first from the universities and then the universities raised it to their members of Congress, raised it in the press. I mean, it became a lot bigger than some minor agency action. And it is possible the White House did not expect that. Um, I would say that they rescinded the order. Uh, They went back to the March uh, order for now, but there's a lot of um, belief that at some point, some new guidance will be coming forth. 
Um, it's unclear when or how, but uh, it's rare for the administration to completely back off of something like this. Um, there was speculation that foreign students would have been included in the non-immigrant visa suspension uh, that the um, work visa suspension that the administration issued earlier this year, earlier this year they, it wasn't. It was done in this way. Maybe it was an attempt to do it in a little bit of a lower key way. Um, I also think that there is a sense that these are people who are already in the United States. Uh, they've already made commitments that kicking them out is just fundamentally unfair. And I think you see that same public perception when it comes to, you know, deporting all 11 million undocumented immigrants in the United States. That is not a popular uh, position. Uh, you know, a majority of Americans do not believe we should be deporting all 11 million, um, or especially the Dreamers, for example. So I think there's a similar, if you will, um, uh, pattern at play here that you're talking about people for whom something had been granted and now it's being pulled away. Uh, and, and that that's, is seen as fundamentally unfair. Yeah, I wonder if you could expand a little bit, Teresa, on the path forward as you see it. You're, it sounds like you suspect the administration might want to take another run at this. How might they approach that? Well, they could approach it by, you know, uh, an, another order that is a, a little more clear. There's still a lot of unanswered questions, even reverting back to the prior guidance. For example, uh, freshman students or students that are beginning a course of study in the United States still cannot enter if they're only going to be taking online classes. The, the order doesn't change that provision, which was already in, um, in, in the regulations. So higher education institutions are still going to lose um, the, that group of incoming freshmen, if you will. And that's, a, that's still a very big thing. Also, they haven't decided what a hybrid curricula might look like, a hybrid curricula of partially in-person and partially uh, online classes might look like. So the universities are still trying to find guidance as to what's a sufficient number of in, of in-person classes, what's a full course of study, what kind of exceptions are available. There's a lot of guidance that is still needed that the agency is not giving. They're being very quiet. And by not giving any guidance, they're making people run the risk of somehow in the future running afoul of whenever they do decide to make a decision. Um, and as I said, uh, we still don't know a lot about how, for example, optional practical training, which is work authorization given to certain foreign students while they're in their course of study or after their course of study, might be affected by this, or if the administration is still planning on rescinding that. They have talked for a long time about repealing those regulations that authorize optional practical training. So uh, I think that for people, for institutions of higher education, for people who advocate for and are, are, are uh, foreign international students, and people are international students, um, there's a sense of, hey, we won now, but with this administration, there could be another shoe to drop, so stay tuned. Yeah, I, I think if you look at the pattern of what the administration has been doing with asylum policies, for instance, at the U.S.-Mexico border, um, they just simply kept up the pressure and keep putting out policy after policy after policy. So the, the question is whether they're going to be following the same pattern here um, and they maybe they lost here, but they're going to turn around and try to target international students in another way. Um, that's been a pretty persistent pattern. So um, like Teresa said, stay tuned because, um, you know, the administration likes to take two or three swings at an issue. All right. That's a good place to leave it. Chris, Teresa, thanks so much for joining me. And thanks to you for listening. We will be back in two weeks. But before we go, a quick reminder, subscribe, rate, and review this podcast on Apple Podcasts, Google Play, Stitcher, Spotify, or your favorite platform. You can also find more information on all the issues we discuss here on the show at bipartisanpolicy.org slash immigration. This Week in Immigration was created by Teresa Cardinal-Brown and myself. The executive producer of This Week in Immigration is Teresa Cardinal-Brown. This week's episode was written by Chris Ramon and myself. Our producers are Chris Ramon and Yafet Tawahada. Our editor is Yafet Tawahada. The executive producer of BBC Podcasts is Ashley Swearingen. I'm Jordan Lapierre. Join us again next time on This Week in Immigration. 